welcome Robin Lithgow to Backstage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I think you've re read in the messages we've sent out, uh, Robin grew up in Yellow Springs. Um, she, uh, Barry, I, and a fourth friend of ours, Jessica Andrews, who is probably on the second screen. Um, so we grew up together and did theater together and watched theater together and um, performed together as a little quartet. Our signature song was I don't want to play in your yard. <laughs> and <laughs> it brought down the house every time. <laughs> okay. Um, so we are also going to hear from Ellen Leary and Patrick Tovat, who are going to enact some of the stuff that Robin is talking about. So I think I can begin. Hi, Robin. Hello, Paula. <laughs> um, could you maybe start by talking about uh, growing up in Yellow Springs? As I recall, you told us that one of your first experiences as a child was opening the fridge and seeing your father's head there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was lying in a bed of lettuce. <laughs> it was covered with blood. The hair was matted with blood. He had terrifying expression on his face. I was four. <laughs> My mother ran over and said, it's a prop, honey. <laughs> he was playing Macbeth. Yeah. So lessons yeah. from Shakespeare's classroom, empowering learning through drama and rhetoric. I think I may be the only person on the face of the earth who has the experience to write the book because of the combination of my two strands of my life growing up with Shakespeare from the ages of... Uh, four to 18, I was, you know, every summer there was a Shakespeare festival and I didn't want to go to summer camp or do anything else. I just wanted to be at the Shakespeare festival, you know, getting underfoot, uh, doing actors, running errands. All of us got to play small parts occasionally. I was the murdered Duke in Richard III, although John took credit for that later in life. <laughs> I had to call him on that. But uh, it was it was a fantastic childhood. And then, of course, um, I was for 35 years in education. And for the last 14 years of my career, I was the head of the arts education branch in L.A. Unified, which is the second largest district in the country. And um, I was able to start the elementary arts program and hire the first 60 elementary theater teachers. We had six, we hired 60 theater, 60 dance, 60 visual arts, which sounds like a lot, but that was to serve over 550 elementary schools. So wow. it, we, we were on a trajectory to get to everybody, but then the uh, bottom fell out of the economy in 2008. And, we lost a lot of ground, but we didn't we didn't lose everything. And now there's a new initiative in the, in the state bringing money into the arts. So late in my career, there was a, there were a few ahas that um, set me on the course for writing this book. In Elizabethan education, in the schools, the open space at the center of each classroom, you couldn't look at all three slides for a minute and then maybe go back you see the open space at the enter at the center of each classroom that space was called the auditorium the place to be heard and in each one a student is standing and being heard i don't know about the dog yeah. <laughs> nobody's ever explained that to me but um the students sitting around the edges of the room, oh, and, and of course he's, he's speaking to the headmaster who is, you know, in a throne-like chair. He was, uh, we, we should all be so exalted when we're teaching school. <laughs> um, maybe that would help. <laughs> but in this case, he's, he's in a throne-like chair and he's, and the room is surrounded by students against the edges and they're holding something in their laps 
Um, those are not textbooks. Those are something called tables. Do you remember in Hamlet when he says, my tables, my tables, meet it is, I set it down that one may smile and smile and be a villain. <laughs> those are their tables. And a student always had tables every week a student had to memorize 16 lines of poetry. So those lines of poetry would be written down in their tables for them to go home and study. And then they would have passages, they would cut columns for all the rhetorical terms that they had to learn and, the, and examples of rhetorical devices. They had to learn about 140 rhetorical devices. We, we learned about 25 in our careers and many people don't learn that many, but they had to learn five times that many. And these were in Latin, right? And yes, they were in Latin, but they had to apply them in English too. The education was entirely in Latin, but their study of rhetorical devices referred also to English. So when Shakespeare was writing his plays in English, he was incorporating about 130, 40, 50 rhetorical devices constantly. And he was trained in that rigorously, rigorously trained. Literally, the teachers would walk around the room saying, perquam figurum, what figure are you using? That was a constant refrain and students had to know exactly what they were using. Now, so they were not published in, I mean, they were, they were published as textbooks. And you see Pamphilius is P-A and Maria, is M-A, you see it's all run together. It's not, they didn't use the traditions that we use now, but these were the only editions of these colloquies when I started this research that I could find. They have never been published in modern font, published uh, online for a very obscure site for Latin teachers. And I, a couple of my, my Latin teacher friends were able to find them for me. So I finally was able to find them in a font that I could read, but, um, and, I, and I have five of them in the book that I have uh, translate, I've updated the, there's been two translations, none in Shakespeare's lifetime. If Shakespeare read the colloquies, he read them in Latin and Latin and Latin only, but they have been translated twice, one in the 18th century and one in the 1950s. So you can get your hands on those. This is the one from the 1950s, very, very shoddy copy. It was the best I could get. And this is a Xerox copy of the one from the 1870s. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the 18, 18th century, excuse me. So other than that, there's, you can't get them. Uh, so I, I, what happened was I, I, about 15 years ago, I was reading a, a biography of Shakespeare by a wonderful writer, Jonathan Bate. Uh, really, my favorite biography of Shakespeare, I think, was called Soul of the, Soul of the Age. And in it, he, re, he mentioned one of the colloquies. colloquies. It was a colloquy between a, uh, he, a, a, an old man and a young girl in which he gets the uh, anyway it, it show, the very same colloquy shows up in, in Taming the Shrew when Petruchio tells Kate to uh, to address this old man as a budding virgin sweet you, you know Patrick you probably are aware of that budding virgin sweet whatever that comes right out of an Erasmus colloquy a funny Erasmus colloquy which Jonathan Bate referred to so I thought, well, he must have written other colloquies. So I went and I got these two editions and I started to read them and I thought, oh my God, has nobody ever read these things? And I think nobody had, no, at least nobody who had the level of familiarity that I have and that Jessica has and that Barry has and that and and Paula has with the 
funny characters. You know, when we were little, we loved the plays. They were scintillating, they were exciting, they were fantastic, but it wasn't, it wasn't the, I, I, unless they were handsome, like <laughs> David Hooks, it wasn't the royals that we, or the, the, the important <laughs> characters that we were interested. We liked the funny people. And, and there they all were. There they all were in the colloquies. Mm. Falstaff, mm. Ardolf, Nim, Mistress Quickly, Dull Tearsheet, all the funny characters, all the, and all the smart, sassy, in your face women. Think Kate, Beatrice, Vi Rosalind, Viola, just for start. Let's see if I missed anything. Yeah, we got we got to play on the stage a little bit when we were young. We we got to play play fairies, murdered children, things like that. But we we really we really were just hanging around, listening, and watching these fabulous rehearsals, plays, you know, from the stage, from the audience, from all just constant. It was a constant in our lives. Um, now. Shakespeare stole brilliantly from many sources, as did everybody back then. There were no laws about that. But as far as I know, nobody's ever explored how just how much he stole from Erasmus, or really how funny, really funny Erasmus was. So echoes, especially in the comedies like Taming of the Shrew, As You Like It, Comedy of Errors, Twelfth Night, and the Tempest, all of those have echoes of Erasmus's comedies and we're gonna have an exhibition of that today. Let's start with the sparring couples found in this place. Kate and Petruchio, Beatrice and Benedict, Rosalind Orlando, Silvius and Phoebe, just to name a few. I was astonished to find that they all had their origin in Prochi at Puele, which you just saw, a lover and his lass. And Ellen and Patrick are about to perform scenes the first scene um from that colloquy i will rudely be interrupting them i have to rudely interrupt them to point out the echoes in shakespeare's plays but first realize they are going to read them in english Good not ever performed in English in Shakespeare's day. Shakespeare heard them, saw them, acted in them only in Latin. But we don't know Latin anymore. So Ellen and Patrick have to perform them in English. So here we go, Proki at Puella. Good morrow, madam, cruel, hard heart, inflexible. Good morrow to you, Mr. Pamphilius, as often and as much, and by what names you please, but you seem to have forgotten my name. It's Maria. It should rather have been Martia. Why so? What is Mars to me? Because just as Mars makes a sport of killing men, so do you, saving that you do it the more cruelly of the two, because you kill one that loves you. Say you so. Pray Where's the great slaughter of men that I have made? Where's the blood of the slain? You may see one dead corpse before your face if you look upon me. What strange story is this? Does a dead man talk and walk? I wish I may never meet with a more frightful ghost than you. Aye, indeed, you make a jest of it. But for all that, you kill poor me, and more cruelly, too, than if you stuck a dagger in my breast. For now I, poor wretch as I am, die a lingering death. Oh, oh, prithee tell me, how many women with child have miscarried at the sight of you? <laughs> okay, rude interruption number one. <laughs> Um, and this one refers, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize in uh, uh, Silvius and Phoebe in As You Like It. And see if you can hear any echoes in this. 
from the passage, the Latin passage that we just heard. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe, say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common executioner, whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humbled neck, but first begs pardon. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tell'st me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty sure and very probable that eyes that are the softest and frailest things who shut their coward gates on atomies should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. <laughs> <laughs> now counterfeit to swoon. Why now fall down? Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wound my eye hath made in thee. Hmm? Scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean but upon a, a rush, the cicatrice and capable in pressure thy palm some moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt me <laughs> not, nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Okay, uh, aren't you glad that Shakespeare didn't write in Latin? <laughs> 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 so delicious, so delicious, thank you. Um, do you hear the similarities? The, the darting eyes, the killing, the, you know, the, I mean, it's all right out of, uh, out of the colloquy, right? And then let's go on to Orlando and Rosalind. Then in mine own person, I die. Oh no, Faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old. And in all this time, there was not any man died in his own person in a love cause. Men have died from time to time and worms <laughs> have eaten them but not for love. <laughs> now remember that uh, we see Rosalind here, in, in the picture was at the end of the play when she's in a dress, but when she was performing those, she was dressed as a boy and Orlando thought she was a boy. He, uh, then, then Pamphilius, we go back to the, the colloquy, Pamphilius and Maria, my paleness shows I have no more blood in my body than a ghost. Indeed, you are as pale as a violet. You are as pale as a ripe cherry or a purple <laughs> grape. You coquette it with my misery. Another interruption. I remember that was in Latin. And in English, Rosalind. There are none of my uncle's marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. I would have loved to see, have seen you perform that in the 60s. You, you, <laughs> you, you, it's so wonderful. Okay, back to the colloquy, Latin, and Maria. If you can believe me, if you can't believe me, look in the glass. I would never desire a better glass, nor do I believe there is a better glass in the world than I am looking in already. What looking glass do you mean? Your eyes. And this echo is from Taming of the Shrew. Nay, come, good Kate, come. You must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. 
Why, here is no crab, and therefore look not sour. There is, there is. Then show it to me. <laughs> Had I a glass, I would. What, you mean my face? Well aimed for such a young one. <laughs> Oh. Do you hear that? Do you hear the echo there? Hmm. Glass and 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 in, the late, in another colloquy, he even has the three-legged stool that that Kate picks up and threatens him with. It's it's really amazing. Okay, back to the Latin. You banterer, that's just like you. But how do you prove yourself to be dead? Do dead folks eat? Yes, they do, but things that have no relish, as I do. Hmm. What feed upon? Oh, mallows, leeks, and lupins. But you feed upon capons and partridges. <laughs> if I do, I relish them no more than beets without pepper or vinegar. Oh, poor creature. But you're in pretty good health for all that. And do dead folks talk, too? Uh, yes, as do I, with a weak voice. <laughs> but when I heard you rallying your your uh, your rival a little while ago, your voice was loud enough then. But prithee, do ghosts walk, wear clothes, and sleep? Yes, and enjoy one another too after their manner. Oh, thou art a merry fellow. Thank you so much, <laughs> so much. That was so fantastic. I, oh. I wish I could have been there in the '60s. I left. I left. I had left Yellow Springs by then. Um, yeah, the frightful ghost again. So, there are many other examples from um, from Shakespeare. The 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 uh, there's a whole a whole colloquy called Uxor, a marriage, which has tons of, of which Shakespeare pulled from so much um, that I really think, I, I, there was an, an Ur copy of Taming the Shrew um, in, the, in the 1580s, and people don't know who wrote it, but I'm convinced that it was Shakespeare who wrote that when he first came or, or, or you know, had people perform that when he first came, because it came right out of his playful play with the colloquies in, in uh, his class in Stratford. And um, there's also a, a colloquy called Heralia. The servant master echoed in uh, Grumio and Petruchio involved a lot, involving a lot of swatting around and servant abuse that fed right into Taming the Shrew. Um, so I'm convinced that when, when Shakespeare arrived in London as a young actor, he brought those scenes with him. Um, now there's another, there's another, there are so many other examples, but I'll give a few. There's a long, long, long colloquy called naufragium, which means shipwreck. Um, the Tempest, The Merchant of Venice, Twelfth Night, and Comedy of Errors, and other plays all have shipwrecks in them. And in two of them, there are rescues involving a, a mast torn from the, the deck of, the sinking, of a sinking ship. They, they, with the characters being saved by tying themselves to the mast. Now, in, um, in Comedy of Errors, Old Aegean describes his wife and himself surviving a shipwreck by tying themselves to either end of a mast, each of them holding two babies, mm -hmm. one of their own and one of the twins. You remember that? Being tied to a mast. And then, of course, Sebastian in Twelfth Night survives a shipwreck by tying himself to a mast. Ah. Now, where does this image come from? These were written 60 years before Shakespeare was born or 40 years before Shakespeare was born. Did he just come up with these images himself from Teestein? He 
No, he was a nine, 10 or 11 or 12 year old boy performing these. And he had a mother at home with a baby. And he definitely imprinted that, you know, that, that image because it shows up twice in his plays. There's, there's another example in As You Like It, by the way, um, you know, when Duke Signor goes into the countryside and he has that long, beautiful passage about life in the countryside, the retreat with his, with his companions. And it ends with the line, books in the running brooks and good in everything. That exact line comes right out of a colloquy called the um, religious retreat in which a group of men in Erasmus's colloquy go out to the countryside and enjoy the pleasures of life outside the city and that conclude with that exact line, but in Latin, education is enriched by performance, you know, empowering learning through drama and rhetoric. James Catterall was, a, I, I don't know how many of you I'm familiar with him, but he was he was a preeminent researcher in um, the importance of arts in education. He wrote Champions of Change, which reversed in 1984 Nation at Risk, which had the the impact of focusing, uh, telling educators they focus only on literacy and numeracy literacy and numeracy cut everything else and all the cart arts were cut not all of them but they it was it was devastating california and all across the country there was a full-time visual arts teacher and a full-time music teacher in every school or the maybe the some of the smaller schools shared but every student in california got a music class and a visual arts class every week. And that was the standard across all of the country. You probably all had a visual arts class and a music class every week if you went to public schools in America. It's gradually coming back, but we're not even back to where it was when I left. I, I mean, not when I left, but when I took over as the, as the head of the arts branch. I, let, let, let's talk about Shirley Bryce Heath for a minute. Um, she, is, or I don't know if any of you are familiar with her, but she, she was a preeminent researcher in, in education. And, and she found that her focus was shifting to arts education back in the 90s and, and aughts. At lunch, I sat next to her and we chatted. And she told me about research she was doing that never got, pub as far as I know, it never got published. She would send students into classrooms and all they did was clock the number of seconds that a student was making eye contact with the lesson or the teacher. In other words, were they looking at the teacher or, what they, or were they looking at what they were doing? And no surprise to me, in arts classes, the eye contact was off the charts. In every, I, I have nothing against daydreaming. I have a whole passage in my book about the value of daydreaming. But you don't daydream when you are doing arts. You are focused, you are attentive, you are engaged, you are present. And it, in, in a, it was just astounding to her, the difference between eye contact in an arts class mm. versus an English class or a math class or a history class or a science class. Mm. Uh, unless it was a science lab, of course. So that was, that was one piece of re research that I found fascinating. Uh, James Catterall became a, a close friend. We were chatting once and I was trying to, um, I was trying to make simple the, vast soup of, of our thinking about cognition. I mean, it's, it's really, it, it's just all over the place. And I was trying to simplify it for teachers. 
and I had kind of in my teaching always, when I needed to, to introduce a complex subject, I would always pare it down to three essentials that we could then expand upon. And so I said to him, what if you pared it down to um, curiosity, exploration, and reflection? You're curious about something, you ask about it, you start to experiment mm -hmm. with it, trial mm -hmm. and error, and then you reflect on what you find. And that, that is the essence of cognition. I, 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 and I was just trying this out on James. And he said, Robin, you've forgotten the most important one. So what's that? Representation. It's in the representation of your learning that you grasp it. Um, Shakespeare was a teacher when he was young. You know, he for a little while he was a teacher, and and he he had that he had that in his quiver, that knowledge that when you teach something, you really really learn it. Um, that addition of representation I found was acting out, acting out what you know, representing what you know, teaching what you know. That's really locks in understanding and cognition and memory. Mm -hmm. Now, in my wildest dreams, um, I would love to move educators away. It's going to take an earth shaking effort move educators away from the current religion practice of drill and kill, test and repeat. The testing culture and the investment in testing culture has been, in my view, and in view of many, many, many of my colleagues across the country, devastating to modern education, absolutely devastating. You, first of all, it tests only a very, very, very narrow slice, slice of learning, very narrow. And it's impossible to test, uh, to have, have, have a test that, that really authentically, well. I'm so glad to hear. Are you, am I hearing I'm somebody like, agree with me? I think, I think someone, there was background noise. I heard, but I, I heard someone say, I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> I was you heard, hoping you were you agreeing heard, with me. <laughs> Robin, you heard Patrick talking on the phone. Oh. <laughs> Somebody else, well, it unfortunately. Was, it was perfect timing, Patrick. <laughs> I, let it be. Uh, okay, so if you disagree with me, raise your hand and I'll uh, just kick you off the screen. No, never mind. Uh, I, I really, I, I really am passionate about this, this uh, desire to kill the testing culture. So that's, that was a primary reason for writing the book. But the most important reason for writing the book is to bring back joy in learning. Nothing, nothing brings back joy in learning more than the arts. Um, I went to the uh, Barry, Paula, Jessica, and I, and maybe many of you went to the Antioch Elementary School, which was entirely Dewey based, entirely ex exper uh, experiential, and full of joy. And um, that concludes my part. I would love to hear from some of you. Uh, so we, I guess we want everyone on a full screen and, and Barry. May I make a, 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 a just a, say something? I'm so sorry that I interrupted your, uh, but that was Diane, uh, Whitney LeBlanc's uh, wife and Whitney passed away. Oh. Maybe oh. before yesterday. Oh. And, that was the call that I, I was taking. Uh, she was telling me that he passed away very peacefully the day before. Oh, so sorry. Thank you for telling us. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Is my voice on? I'm not sure. It's Steve. Yeah, it's Steve. Oh, Steve. Yes. 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 Yes.
a phone call at the beginning of this and left the screen. And that was Diane calling me to tell me the same thing. But, uh, uh -huh. Oh. It had passed. And then I came back and you and Ellen were doing your scene and Ellen had the line, men have died from time to time. <laughs> you know, but he was absolutely central to my education at Antioch. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was the only kid around who was interested in set design. Um, and we've stayed in touch and he watched the Zoom that I did and reached out to me then afterwards. So we, we've exchanged a bit in the period from my Zoom till, and I wondered this when I turned on my screen why he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And then my phone rang as yours did, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Patrick, had you ever been to visit him as you live up? He, he came to visit me. Oh, wonderful. He and Diane, and he gave me, he sent me copies of his novels. Oh, wonderful. And hmm. uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful visit. Jesse, Great. could we have gallery view on so we can see the audience? I think I put it on. We do we have, have gallery view on. Can I say yep. something? <clears throat> uh, Robin, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot. I remembered a lot. It was just so much fun to hear you talk. And I, you know, I knew your dad very well. I lived in his house. <laughs> but um, I want to talk, say something about John Dewey. I just reread John Dewey after like probably 65 or 70 years. And it is just as relevant now. Absolutely. As it, as it was then. And mm -hmm. I recommend that people do that because it will remind you of the, these connections between the artist, the writer, the audience, and how it's actually uh, a collaborative kind of experience putting these things together. I also noticed because I deal with many arts that the process of creating uh, from one art form to another also supports very much what you're saying about kind of bringing all kinds of learning alive. And I've certainly found it as an educator myself and as a trainer. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and I would say about about um, Dewey, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Regio Emilia um, education in, in Italy. Uh, it's, a, it's an early childhood through basically first or second grade education that is entirely project-based where students decide on something they're gonna study and they study it entirely through projects so they will, build a bridge over the course of a year of study and bring in the science and, or, or they will create a, 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 a system of uh, bringing water to a farm or you know, they'll, they'll decide on a project and they'll spend the whole year developing that project and all of their learning will be connected to that, learning by doing. And uh, American teachers go to study this and the teachers at Reggio Emilia will turn to them and say, what are you doing here? We got it all from Dewey. He's yours. <laughs> Why aren't you doing it? Oh, and oh course, like the uh, current Antioch educational model. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I remember everything I learned at the Antioch school and I loved it. Cool. Um, talk about joy and learning, you know, it's, it's, yeah. and I'm so glad that school is still, is still operating. I um, wish, I just, yeah. I we have just a question. to mention that uh, I've been going through boxes and things just to clear out. And I came across this the other day, which is Charlie's aunt and uh, Whitney LeBlanc is there, Stephen Hendrickson. Um, I just thought I would share that because it's, uh, and then of course the cast, Patrick Tovat, uh, let's see, Gwen, that, you were in that too, I think. 
uh, anyway, I just yeah, she, Susan and I had such fun playing together, the two young girls. Well, we just I just found this and I thought, Sue, well, it's Sue so Fred and I. with the uh, Whitney gone now and Stephen mm -hmm. here, of course, with us, which is wonderful. And uh, and directed by Dal. So anyway, just wanted to share. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Rob. We, have a, we have a couple questions in the chat. One is what percentage of the 16th century population in England attended those schools and were educated in Latin? I don't know the percentage, but I know that the numbers were in the thousands. Um, I, it, who is the researcher that I quote in my book? I can't remember. I'll, 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 I'll see if I can, if somebody else is talking, I'll see if I can find her. But, um, you know, it was obviously it was all boys, mostly property boys, although there were, you know, after Henry VIII, there were ever increasing numbers of, of children from the working classes who showed promise, who were allowed a free education in, in, the, in, the, um, in the Latin grammar schools. But Robin. I don't know, yeah. Thank you for quelling the Shakespeare deniers with your research. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a story. I have a story about Shakespeare deniers if you want to hear it, but yeah, sure. Shall, Go ahead. shall I tell it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, whoever wrote those plays grew up in Warwickshire. That's that's that. That's what my dad said. <laughs> Whoever wrote those plays, what? Grew up in Warwickshire. You, you, you know, the, the plays breathe Warwickshire. But my, my funny story is um, I, was, I was in London in 1998 doing a program for uh, American uh, English teachers at the Globe. It was a fantastic program. And um, this sub at one and Louis Fantasia, who put all the speakers together, we had, we had great, great presenters. And he brought one who was a Shakespeare denier. Now, we were a bunch of Shakespeare teachers, so we didn't make it easy for her. But um, we decided we were we would walk her over to the church that was right across the street from the globe. It was an old the 14th century church and it had slabs in the if somebody was very 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 important they could be buried in that church and have a slab in the in the nave there with their name on it otherwise they were just buried out in the field but but if they were a very significant person and guess who's buried in that church Shakespeare's little brother, Edwin, who came to London at the age of 20 and died at 21 mm -hmm. of the plague. Now, what made him so important that he would be buried in that church? <laughs> His brother. <laughs> so that kind of shut her up. He, he, he was not. Uh, Another question yeah. here uh, uh, from the from when Patrick and Ellen were reading colloquies and so the, the question is, were these inside jokes or did everyone get the references? Is there a modern equivalent? Um, I'm sure they were inside jokes. I mean, it, it, he was Erasmus was 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 a clown. He really was a clown. He he well, he wrote. Um, uh, the work he's most famous for, oh, sorry, which, is, yeah. which, is, which my blind mind, who tell, can somebody to please tell me what Erasmus is most famous for? <laughs> <laughs> the, this, not not his matter. translations of the Bible, but, doesn't but matter. Just go a, ahead. Riot, yeah, a riotous lark about the, with the, with, with the, the yeah I'll, I'll i'll think of it but in a minute but he was he was yeah. he was a very he wasn't an erudite man when he got funny 
he was a fascinating person, Robin. And right. you, your book gives the back uh, tells about him. It tells so much about history that 30 years in the Reformation, all the changes that took place all over Europe. That's my brother's favorite chat. My, my brother, my big brother, David's favorite uh -huh. chapter. He said, uh, I never amazing. caught it. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. The world turned upside down. You have two and, people uh, waiting to, to it's speak. It's just, it's a wonderful, Barry, wonderful Barry, book. Barry, uh, Kat, Katie Hickman and Margaret Kinsman have been waiting to speak for a while. Could you give them a chance? Yes, go. Um, go hi, Robin. Katie. Uh, yes. Is that you? Yes. Hi, Katie. Yes. Oh, my God. Are you, did you go to Antioch? Well, no, but Vince did. And, oh. and, and Robin hired me. I was a theater teacher. And um, it's so good to see you. I miss you. I don't and, see your picture. Um, well, I'm, OK, I'm, I'll put it up. I'm here with. Um, with Vince. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. So long since I've seen you. Hi. I know. It's lovely to see you. I'm I'm gonna a little well up here in a moment. Um <laughs> I I I of course learned so much. I'm I'm in my last year of teaching theater in uh high school and have a big open space in my room. And um I'm so grateful for you and can't wait to read your book and um it's just great to to see you <laughs> hey, katie for all of you first of all she's an, an astoundingly good teacher but she's also a really good playwright she's just wait with the way i first met her <laughs> yeah. yeah wonderful to see lovely. you katie thank lovely you lovely to coming. see you <laughs> thank you who is the other person who had a question Margaret uh, I, I also wanted to say thank you, Robin, uh, and go way back to the past. Our families oh. overlapped in Waterville, Ohio. Yes. Um, shortly after, I think you, you, your family left Yellow Springs. Uh huh. And your father awakened my lifelong love of um, Shakespeare with the Tempest one summer at the Toledo Festival. Oh yes. And yes. your brother and I were in the same class. And I'm sure your family was one of the reasons I insisted on going to Antioch and I've never regretted it for a moment. So thank you for that. And thank you for this evening. I'm a teacher. Everything you said about pedagogy speaks to me. And thank you. I, I have never, I have never, I've regretted for the rest of my life, not going to Antioch. I thought going to Antioch was going back to my childhood, so I went to an Ivy League school <laughs> where I learned nothing <laughs> because I wasn't doing it. At Antioch, you do it. I should yeah. have known better. Yes. I did, transferred did to Barnard? Antioch from Harvard. Good for and you. The Good lecture you. section of, uh, of methodology was, I, I absolutely could not relate. I went to Antioch and I was like, oh my God, this is reality. I'm actually learning, learning something. I loved it. I yeah. loved it. I hated yeah. it. Yeah. Well, Harvard to Antioch. Good for you. Congratulations. Courage. Oh, best thing I ever did. Where did you go, Robin? Was it Barnard? I went to Barnard, yes. I can't recommend it. <laughs> I, I had, I actually, I had a couple of fantastic professors. I shouldn't say that, but most of it's just a blur, you know, but you go to college to find friends and adults and to, as, as the president of Barnard said in her very introductory speech, he said, I'm so glad to speak to you all today. I know you've all come to college for sex. <laughs> what? <laughs> for sex. <laughs> this was the you know mid sixties. Like we all sat up. She <laughs> <laughs> was absolutely right. We all went to college for sex. <laughs> can, I, can I get in? Am I? Yes. Out? Go. Uh, Robin. And everybody, I played. 
Bianca to Arthur's Petruccio before the Shakespeare Festival. I was a teenager. Oh. oh. Caroline Wingfield Roth. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Are you Caroline? Oh, yes. Caroline, hello. She's still alive. <laughs> and Arnie's She's still, still alive. alive. And Arnie's alive? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad. I love you guys. Oh, I'm oh, so yeah. glad. We knew you in Yellow Springs and Princeton. And Princeton, yes. And we had, I remember we had um, dinner. Um, I, I, I remember the last dinner I had with you. It was during an election and we were all hoping the guy who lost would win. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. We, uh, yes, we, we were so close to... Uh, Arthur and, and Sally, as we I knew her back in the day, yeah. and uh, we saw them so often. And, and now we live around the corner from John. We, I'm looking out on Central Park West, and he lives a few blocks up the street. I I live in a post-war <laughs> apartment, but it's a great neighborhood to run into John anyway. <laughs> But anyway, I remember the yellow. I was terrible in the part of, of Bianca. <laughs> and, uh, and Arthur came to me and really wanted me to drop out because there were plenty of, of young women in the company. And I, of course, I refused. <laughs> and I was terrible. But the Yellow Springs News said my performance was impeccable. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure you're wrong. I'm sure you were impeccable. <laughs> well, but I didn't realize I was going to see so many old friends. This is really, that's my dad reading to us. He always read to us. He read all the classics, but he also read the comics, which he's doing in this particular picture. And there's my brother, John, hogging the camera, of course. <laughs> that's wonderful. But, uh, Robin, should we look at John's drawings? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th this is this is Shakespeare playing with Legos, a reference to the last <laughs> chapter, the Lego snap of learning. <laughs> Arthur gave Ellen her first uh, professional part and allowed her to join Equity. And so she is, I mean, you know, she adores him anyway, but that was her leg into professional acting. Wasn't yeah. that, I didn't even have to pay him to illustrate my book. <laughs> I, I, he's my little brother. He had to do it. <laughs> well, so we, Patty we, Dallas, had, we had so much fun doing it. Patty Dallas suggests that <clears throat> maybe John could convince Stephen Colbert to have you on his show. <laughs> well, I, we I, can... that would... That would be fun. I guess. We could upset the testing culture in the schools. <laughs> well, you know, um, yes. the one the one um, talk show person who's uh, taken on the testing culture is David Oliver. I'd love to appear on oh, his John show. Oliver. I mean, John Oliver. Uh, so yeah. I have two brothers, yeah. John and David. So anytime <laughs> I have to remember John or David, I switch them around. <laughs> no, John Oliver. Yeah, I'd, that, I'd, that would be, be fun. Yeah, maybe you could get on his show. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you could get on our show. Maybe I'll just get on all of them and then and then sell a hell of a lot of books. <laughs> my goal, <laughs> my goal is really to transform education. Now I'm 80 years old and I'm just getting started. <laughs> Hooray! Hooray! You're just the kid. <laughs> Better late than never. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robin. And thank you in the audience. This has just been wonderful. Thank you.